Now, our speaker uh, needs no introduction, but it's always good to give thanks to God and to him uh, for the fact that Gail Beebe is our president. Um, the scripture says all our days were written in God's book before one of them came to be. And uh, I believe with all my heart that uh, God wrote this day in Gail's book and this day in our book. And I'm grateful that uh, God has brought a man who is so uniquely gifted and qualified to be our president at this time in our history. Uh, there are multiple ways I could describe that. I won't, but just say thank you, Lord. And Gail, thank you for being our president. Thank you for the work you do. Uh, we're eager to hear what you have to say. Let's welcome Gail Beebe. And Father, I pray that your servant will uh, run down the path you set for him, because you've set his heart free, and you've equipped him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Ben. Last year in the opening chapel, I spoke about getting a new vibe and brought out a dreadlocks, dreadlocks uh, wig to identify with Bo Beckendam, who's gone on to greater things, graduated. So this year, as I was getting ready to uh, speak to you, this opening chapel, or at least my opening chapel, I was thinking about who did I want to draft off of for this year to get my new vibe? And I decided I would, I would choose Austin Crowder. <laughs> and thanks be to God, Austin got a haircut. <laughs> Austin, you're looking great. I want to speak to you this morning on what I hope happens during your four years at Westmont. I know some of you are seniors, others juniors, others sophomores, and then freshmen. But as you enter this, the start of our new academic year, there are really two priorities that I have for you. It is my hope that you will engage your studies fully, that you'll go through the rigorous academic preparation that will allow you to serve God faithfully wherever he may take you. But in the process of that, that you'll also have the opportunity to know yourself before God and to have the spiritual resources cultivated in you that can sustain you all your life. And so I want to share with you when I do share about the ways in which God has shaped my own life and to give you the spiritual and intellectual resources that God has used in my life with the hopes that some of them will fit you, but mostly that they'll encourage you to reach for the spiritual and intellectual resources that can matter for you at this point in your life and can sustain you as you go forward. When I was a student graduating from college, 1981, I was 22 years old. Life was very good. It was very predictable. Everything was happening as it should. My parents were healthy. My grandparents were healthy. Nobody had died out of sequence. Within 10 years of graduating from college, everything had changed. And what I realized is my father had died quite tragically and unexpectedly. My grandparents had passed away. Uh, accidents had happened to extended family members. One of my longest and dearest friends had died in a mountain climbing accident on Mount Washington in Oregon. And I had had the opportunity to come to terms with so many of the re realities that confront us in our life. And although I didn't have all the spiritual resources when I graduated from college, as a result of going to college and even attending Westmont, I had the opportunity to acquire the resources that did guide me through some of these very tumultuous times. Now, I recognize that some of you have entered Westmont having lived and experienced many of the things that I only hope come to you later in life. Regardless of where you are this morning, it is my hope that you will begin to cultivate and to build upon the life God has given you and his desire for that life. As I became a Christian, or as I owned the faith for my, myself during my junior year of high school, I was raised in a Christian home, certainly had all the resources, but uh, accepted Christ when I was in sixth grade, uh, mostly out of a fear of hell. Uh, the pastor was very convincing, and I was convinced. I was convinced that I didn't want to go to hell, and that if I didn't do something right then, it was a likely possibility. 
But when I was 17, I really wanted to give my life fully and completely to Christ. And I had a wonderful uh, youth pastor who basically said, no matter where you go in life, whatever you do, the ways in which you can always see if your life is in alignment with the purposes of Christ is to reflect on the fruit of the Spirit and to evaluate yourself as to how well the fruit of the Spirit is being manifest in your own life. As I look back on that simple instruction, it has become a great guide for me. And I find myself almost every morning, in addition to the readings I enjoy doing, reflecting on what will it mean for me to live today with the fruit of the Spirit. And often before we go to bed at night, I have the opportunity to reflect on how well did I live by the fruit of the Spirit? How well were they expressed in my life? In what ways was I out of sync with God and as a consequence out of sync with the people that I worked with and with whom I love. And so as we start this morning, I want to read this very profound and well-known passage from Galatians 5, reminding us of what is the quality of the life that we all desire. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Now that is a great reminder of what it means to live with the fullness of the life of Christ present in our own life. And yet so often in life we get distracted and we, we end up thinking, we're supposed to be doing one thing when really we're supposed to be doing another. I often think that one of the great lapses to which we're vulnerable as college students is believing that we're supposed to be pursuing God when actually we're supposed to be doing our homework. Or believing that we're supposed to be doing our homework when in fact you're in chapel and you're supposed to be drawing near to God. And one of the great opportunities that you have is to learn how to develop the judgment that will guide you and allow you to use reason in a proper way so that whatever you're doing, you'll be able to discern what is the proper activity to which I should attend during this time. One of my favorite parables, one of my favorite philosophers is Zorn Kierkegaard, the great Danish philosopher from the 19th century. And he's written many profound works of philosophy, but lighter reading if you need it from time to time a wonderful collection of parables. Kierkegaard, at different periods of his life, wanted to come as close as he could to imitating the life of Christ. And he particularly wanted to do that through some of his writings. And so he wrote parables, hoping to emulate the parables of Christ. And they're compiled, or various selections of them are compiled in different English translations. And one of my favorites is a parable about a man who escapes from an insane asylum. And as he escapes from the insane asylum, which was located outside of their town, he begins to walk towards the village. And as he comes near the village off on the horizon, he sees a man walking towards him and he begins to get quite agitated. And he's thinking to himself, if I don't say something, they're going to recognize me, realize I'm from the insane asylum, arrest me and take me back. And so the closer that the man comes and as the, the escapee uh, continues to feel this anxiety inside himself, closer they come, as they come upon each other, the escapee says, or blurts out, the earth is round. Of course, the man recognizes that this is such an absurd, absurd statement in the context of, of their walk, recognizes he must be an escapee from the insane asylum, calls the authorities, they arrest him and take him back. Well, Kierkegaard's point in this is that so often we say things that are true, but they're completely out of place. And as a result of that, we end up looking as silly as people who are confined to insane asylums. One of the great opportunities we have as followers of Christ is to learn what it means to live a life with God and to acquire the resources that can sufficiently guide us. Several years ago, I was being asked to speak. This was before I had written or co-authored the book with Richard Foster called Longing for God. It came out a little over two years ago. And so as I was getting ready to speak, I was thinking about how do I actually understand my own life with God? And at this point in time, how do I make sense of it? Well, I had been reading and studying. I was probably 20 years past college at this point. And I really began to work out this diagram that I've put on your handout for this morning. 
And what I began to realize is that there had been many resources that had been given to me that had helped me understand this life with Christ. First and foremost were the qualities that were embodied in the nine fruits of the Spirit. And I often just think about what a beautiful thing it is that we can so succinctly, so succinctly evaluate how we're doing in our life with Christ based on how we behave. What are the attitudes we express? What are the attitudes we display? And as a result of that, take an immediate inventory of whether or not we're in sync with God and likewise in sync with one another. And so I encourage you, as you live your life at Westmont, every day or as often as you can, at least once a day, try to think about in what ways have you expressed love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now these are wonderful qualities and they're given to us not as ways in which we can become legalistic, but really ways in which we can take a spiritual inventory of how well or how, how well we are, how well we are with God and how well we are with one another. Now if you go through each one, and we won't take extensive time now, but each of them has a particular quality that gets at a manifestation of a wonderful behavior that causes us to be inviting to those who are around us. People who experience a spirit of love in us are drawn to us. I find myself consistently drawn to people who express joy. In fact, I love having people who, who just have a natural joy around because they always make whatever we're doing more meaningful. Peace, the, the sense of contentment and complete well-being. Patience. One that is so often missing from our lives. I, I often think of when I'm driving up and down Sycamore Canyon Road, you come to those four-way stops and you just see people at the height of their impatience as they're waiting for who's gonna go next. And something that I've enjoyed doing just in a very simple way is just coming to the stop sign at the same time as somebody else and motioning them uh, to go ahead of me, so because they really wanted to anyway, and if you just reach out and motion to them, it not only cultivates in me a sense of patience, but also makes the interaction uh, in life go easier. Now, I can tell you, I was noticing all the announcements, cautioning you about speeding up and down Cold Spring. Let me just guarantee you, for the first month that you're here, Sheriff Brown has assigned deputies to patrol our streets, and I'm not exaggerating. You are such easy pickings for tickets. This is just an aside. So I encourage you, exercise patience. Work on that fruit of the spirit. Otherwise, you'll have an opportunity to pay a big fine, and that's just another way to develop patience. <laughs> Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Each of these magnificent qualities that in and of themselves uh, are so compelling, and yet so often uh, when we get out of sync, when we get under pressure, we recognize how hard it is for us to actually live uh, with these qualities manifest in our own life. And then the next band, the ways in which we learn to think theologically. Uh, I began to uh, study theology when I was uh, an undergraduate. One of the richest experiences of my life was coming to Westmont as a consortium exchange student in the fall of 1980 to study with Dr. Gundry. I had to take three other classes, which were all wonderful as well, but I was particularly here to study New Testament theology with Dr. Gundry and to really gain a deeper understanding uh, of our Bible, of the scriptures, and the, the way in which God's holy word is meant to lead and guide us. Well, since that time, I've just devoted so much of my life to studying theology and communicating about it. But here in just a, a brief framework uh, are six ways in which we understand our life with God. And I really do believe that to be consistent uh, with the historic faith, you always have to begin with Scripture. And when I talk about Scripture, I like to read Scripture at three levels. I, I believe you should read Scripture literally, in context, and in conversation with itself. Now, this is what I mean. If you read the Bible literally, it helps you get a sense of the flow of the story. And as Austin even said, as we pass out this one-year Bible, some parts of the Bible are very difficult. But don't give up. Ask people who know more about the Bible. Where are places that you can read that will actually matter? But learn the differences between Scripture. What is the difference between Genesis and the Gospel of John? What is the difference between Psalms, Proverbs, the book of Isaiah. 
And as you get into these differences, you begin to recognize the texts that actually matter to you and really, really guide you, really enrich you. But scripture in and of itself, read literally, isn't enough. I often compare Deuteronomy 21 with Ephesians 6. Now, Deuteronomy 21, among other things, says, if a son talks back to his father, take him outside the city gates and stone him to death. We no longer recommend that. But Ephesians 6 says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Do not provoke your children to wrath. And you recognize, even within scripture, that there are these tensions and there are these unfolding revelations that allow us to see a more nuanced and deeper understanding of our life with God. But ultimately, I think you have to not only read scripture in context, but get scripture to talk to itself so that you can have the richest understanding possible of our life with God. Now, the other uh, components, reason, God has given us the capacity to think. And it's just a marvelous quality that God allows us to think. You are here not only to continue thinking, but to learn how to think at an even greater level. When I was with the parents last Friday morning, I talked to them about one of my favorite principles, which is entitled A Plausibility Structure. This comes from a book by Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And it's during a time of great upheaval in uh, general thinking and specifically Christian thinking. But the idea of a plausibility structure is that you have a certain understanding or a framework of meaning. And as long as everything you've experienced fits within that framework, your plausibility structure is intact. However, if you begin to have new experiences, which college is all about, these broadening experiences, you have to enlarge, reframe, uh, reconceive your plausibility structure. And some of the real disruption to your life and to your thought is a result of new, experience, new experiences disrupting the way that you thought about your life. Now, I think one of the greatest opportunities you have during your time at Westmont is to be around people that can help you reconceive your life with God, with all of the new experiences that will be poured into this life. And as you reconceive this plausibility structure, it will enlarge, it will expand, it will come to have a new and broader meaning. But it can all be done in ways that honor and serve the Lord. Uh, tradition. Get in touch with the rich traditions of the church. Uh, I love the fact that you have the oppor opportunity to study doctrine. Uh, I ran into some students this morning who are headed to Marianne Robbins uh, Perspectives, World Perspectives class. All of these ways in which we gain a great understanding of how things that went before us still influence us today. Well, in the life of the church, there are so many experiences coming down through the 2,000 year history of the church that still guide and inform us. And then experiences. What are our experiences of God and how do we understand those? What can we understand from the natural world? And then how does our culture influence us? One of my favorite articles from several years ago was an article written by a missionary who had come back and was teaching at Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington. And the, the article was entitled, How Culture Conditions Our View of Scripture. And it was a comparison of how the Hmong Mountain people of Laos read scripture, with how Chinese immigrants in the Philippines read scripture, with how Western undergraduate students at Whitman College read scripture. And to put it succinctly, the Hmong mountain people were most interested in the miracles, the signs and wonders of God. And they wanted to know, was the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob more powerful than their gods? And that's what they wanted to know. The Chinese immigrants to the Philippines were very interested in the practical, pragmatic, ways of life. Who knows how to live life the best? And this gentleman writes about the fact that for two years they observed his life and they wanted to know, does he live a better life than the ways in which we've been taught to live? And then when they became convinced, part of their convincement was recognizing the ways in which the Bible lays out these very practical ways for us to live that actually build community and allow us to love one another. And then finally when he came home, came back to the United States, was teaching 18 to 22 year olds in a college setting, he recognized that what mattered to his students in class was whether or not these things were true. The point of the article was to illustrate for us that there are multiple ways in which we come to scripture, we raise questions, and all of these need to be addressed in a way that keep us within an understanding of God at the same time we address our unique concerns. 
Well, after that, I began to think about how do I make sense of my life with God? And after I finished at Westmont, I worked for our denomination for a year, traveled throughout the Northwest, and then went to Princeton Theological Seminary where I had the opportunity to study with Diogenes Allen. Dr. Allen is just another, another one of those personalities in my life that has meant so much to me and has helped me understand at such a deep level this wonderful life with God that we enjoy. And it was Dr. Allen that in, introduced me to Blaise Pascal. And I am an insufferable devotee of Blaise Pascal. I first began to read him in 1983. I still have uh, the Penguin copy that I bought then. It's marked up, it's just tattered. Uh, and if anybody wants to meet with me and read Pascal, I will always give them a free copy of the Ponces and we'll meet with you as often as we can because Pascal has meant so much to me in terms of my own understanding of our life with God. Now, when you read Pascal, why did he matter to me? The reason Pascal mattered to me is that I was still wanting to know, or I, I still believed myself to be wanting to know, whether or not the Christian life had intellectual credibility. And I think for each one of us, there are questions in our life that we have to have answered. And many of us, we come to Christ because we have these powerful encounters with God and they draw us closer to Christ. I know that what drew me into the Christian life was the loving example of my parents, of the church I attended, of the youth leaders that I was with. And there was something just fundamentally different about them from what I would experience when I went to high school or when I was around friends who were not Christians. And I loved it. I loved the fact that these people reflected the love of Christ. But I think after we come to Christ, all of us begin to wrestle with our faith. And at some level, we have to have these questions answered. And so Pascal was the one who really helped me begin to understand and address the questions that, that I needed answering. Now, the, the chart that I have uh, in the outline that you have in front of you looks uh, confusing, but it really makes good sense, particularly if you spend four or five years mastering it. Thank you for laughing. But this is taken from fragment 308. And uh, I'll explain the other fragments in a moment. But, but this is just a profound way in which you can understand what it means to live a life with God. Pascal says that there are three orders differing in kind. And that all of us live out of one of the three orders. He said some people live on the order of the body. The faculty that matters are the senses. The principle of judgment is the appetites. In other words, these are people who simply live uh, under the control of their desires. The object of importance becomes power and consumption, and the kind of life it leads to is one of unbridled desire. And by unbridled desire, he means that you are never satisfied, that there is this compulsion to continually have the next experience because you do not feel settled in your own life. And as long as you can have that experience and pursue those experiences, it keeps you from thinking about the reality of the life you face. Now he goes on to say, there's a second order, and that's the order of the mind. And on the order of the mind, the faculty that matters is the intellect. The principle of judgment is comprehensive, comprehensiveness, the ability to understand. The object of importance is knowledge, but the kind of life it leads to is not one of unbridled desire, but of pride. And pride comes from the fact that you lord your knowledge over other people. Francis Bacon once said knowledge is power, and so often we use knowledge as a source of power and also as a source of pride. Now Pascal goes on to say that these two orders are natural orders, and they often, if we're living out of one of these two orders, they often blind us to our life with God. And we don't come into this wonderful experience of the love and grace and peace that comes from God alone. But he says, if you live out of the order of the heart, the order of the heart is a supernatural order. The faculty that matters is the will. Essentially, is your will aligned with the will of God or are you self-willed? The principle of judgment is charity. And he means by this the classical term of being full of love and free of evil. Being full of love and free of evil. The object of importance is holiness and wisdom, living a life that honors God and also having discernment so that you can understand the ways of God. And the kind of life it leads to is one of humility because you recognize your proper place in the universe. Now Pascal goes on to say that if you live out of the order of the heart, 
Why this is the right ordering of our love for God is because it shows you the right use of reason, your intellect, and it also shows you the proper satisfaction of desire. One of the great challenges for life today in the United States is the fact that so many people live out of the order of the body and don't have a sense of how to satisfy their desires properly. Now, I believe God gives all of us desires. And I think that when God gives us desires, he also gives us a pattern for how they should be satisfied in a way that honors him. And when you live out of the order of the heart, it shows you the right use of reason and also the right way in which you can satisfy the desires God gives you. Now, there are many other fragments that I've listed here, and I wanted to have them sent home with you because we wouldn't have time to get through all of them. And uh, besides, that would be too much information. But if you, if you just look briefly, fragment 12, that fragment deals with the three things Pascal wanted to achieve. To show that religion is not contrary to reason, but worthy of reverence and respect. Make it attractive. And then show that it is. He talks about our greatness. Fragment 133, diversions. Listen to this. This, this is just, just gets so at the, the root of so many of the activities that take us away from God. Being unable to cure death, wretchedness, and ignorance, men have decided in order to be happy not to think about such things. <laughs> and what he goes on when he talks about diversion, you think about people, certainly not you, but perhaps your roommates, who are just filled with these compulsions to keep them from facing the true nature of who they are. Fragment 149 is just brilliant. And if you skip down to the last paragraph, see where it starts, what religion? He's trying to get at how can I frame our quest for truth so that we know what we need to satisfy. And this is what he says. What religion then will teach us how to cure pride and concupiscence? Concupiscence is unbridled desire. What religion in short will teach us our true good, our duties, the weaknesses which lead us astray, the cause of these weaknesses, the treatment that can cure them, and the means of obtaining such treatment. All the other religions have failed to do so. Let us see what the wisdom of God will do. And then he concludes that fragment with this line which reminds me of Matthew 13, where Jesus is interpreting his parable. There is enough light for those who desire only to see, and enough darkness for those of a contrary disposition. And I so often think about you know, when you go through periods of doubt, if you believe that God will get you through this, eventually he will. And when I have gone through periods of some of the darkest doubts and some of the great questioning periods of my own life, I always thought about people that I considered smarter than me, better equipped than I am, great embodiments uh, of life and all of its manifestations. I thought if they can be Christians, eventually this will make sense to me. And in every case, God has always come back and, and has always made himself known to me in ways that mattered to me, helped me answer the questions that had really riddled me, and allowed me to live with a new understanding of him. And then I love this fragment 170 on submission. I shared this with you, uh, pardon me, I shared this with the freshman during orientation. Because this gets at understanding uh, the right use of reason. One must know when it is right to doubt, to affirm, to submit. Anyone who does otherwise does not understand the force of reason. Some men run counter to these three principles, either affirming that everything can be proved because they know nothing about proof, or doubting everything because they do not know when to submit, or always submitting because they do not know when judgment is called for. Skeptic, mathematician, Christian, Doubt, affirmation, submission. And then fragment 308 deals with the three orders which the chart is based on and these three levels of reality. And I actually, you could spend the rest of your life thinking about the profound understanding that Pascal communicates here because so many of the differences between people could really be, really be boiled down to what order of life are you living from? If you're living from the order of the body, the order of the mind doesn't make sense to you. If you're living from the order of the mind, the order of the body and the order of the heart don't make sense to you. But ultimately, if you live from the order of the heart, you can recognize the right use of the order of the mind and the right use of the order of the body. And God allows this ordering uh, for our purposes. 
Fragment 418 deals with the wager, and those of you who are in philosophy, uh, this is often the best known part of Pascal. And essentially, the wager, I often think of it as, uh, Pascal was trying to help people who had no inclination to God, to consider the possibility of God. And, and basically, here's what the wager says. The wager says, let's pretend uh, that God doesn't exist. Or pardon me, let's pretend God does exist. You live your life as if God exists. You die, and you realize after you've died, God doesn't exist. You still have lived a really good life. Conversely, if you pretend that God doesn't exist, and you live your life as if God doesn't exist, you die, and you realize he does exist, boy, are you in big trouble. And it was his way of getting people who were not interested in thinking about the reality of God to consider the possibility of God and to begin to entertain what that would mean. And then fragment 913 is actually this parchment, or pardon me, this, uh, this parchment that records his experience of uh, coming, you know, just, uh, truly a visitation of God uh, in 1654 wasn't known about, they found it upon his death, sewn into the inside of his uh, overcoat. Uh, but it talks about just this incredible encounter with God and the way in which it brought Pascal to heartfelt certainty. Now, I realize that this has the capacity to just kind of overwhelm you and for you to leave wondering, how do I get my arms around this? What I want to come back to is the very illustration that I started with in terms of the fruit of the Spirit. All of the resources that you'll be exposed to during your time at Westmont are meant to accomplish one of the two things that I think are the priorities of our work here. To help you grow in your life with God and to prepare you through your academic preparation to serve God in whatever role or whatever avenue of life he has for you. And as you take on yourself the resources that come to us from a Pascal or from others that will be introduced during our time in chapel, it's my hope that you will enter into this life with God with a sense of joy and that you will find in this life with God the opportunity to cultivate the spiritual resources that will guide you the rest of your life and give you the capacity to face whatever God may have for you. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be back in school, to have you back, and to get the new year launched in such a beautiful way. God be with you.